The following is an RC Racing TV special exclusive and contains actual autopsy footage which may contain material which some viewers may find objectionable. Viewer discretion is advised. Until now, race winning RC cars took their secrets with them to the grave. But today, the RC pathologist has the tools and understanding to dissect winning vehicles from the past, allowing them to reveal their secrets with amazing accuracy. Now you can enter this world, a world both fascinating and forbidden. This is the world of RC Autopsy. Tonight on The Slab is... Masami Hirosaka's world-winning Schumacher Cat XLS. What have we got today? Yeah, I was going to say, should we have a look? It's got a big wing. I don't know why that's sitting up so high. Ooh. I know this one. This is, this is, you might have a lot more knowledge on this one than this me, Tris. This is Schumacher Heritage at its finest, really. So what do we have? Tell us. We have a Masami Hirosaka car, uh, which is the old, I don't want to call it old, um, the Cat XLS. Um, and it's a car that went and won us a nice world championships. Which year? Um, it was 87, I believe. So I would have been one and you would have been about two. Yeah, I guess. two or three, depending yeah. on when, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this car, like just going straight into the design part of it, it was Cecil Schumacher um, in his early days of doing his, what was his competition, All Terrain. So it was called, original ones, you had the cat um, car and then you had, I believe, and I'm not an expert on this part of it, but you had a shorter car before and then this car became the longer car, which made it a lot easier to drive. Um, comparing to today's cars, this is still very short and narrow, and as yeah. we know. Um, the car, I understand, was built by Phil Booth. Um, he built a number of different cars for people. He used to kind of upgrade cars and things for people. Um, and he was an engineer at Schumacher for many years as well. Um, so this car um, was raced <coughs> on a bumpy dirt track. Um, there's a famous video out there. And uh, you'll see that the conditions of what was raced in back then to today is very different. Yeah. Um, so actually, quite a few years that that condition was raced in, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, well, it's natural, shall we say. Mm. Just find a field and make it dirt and see what happens. Yeah, and so this was early days of four-wheel drive. It was racing against Tamiya Hot Shots, I believe, and cars of more of a, that, that fun caliber of car that you'd, you'd have now is more of that, almost a basher car, not to be disrespectful to it, towards it. This car was built very in a minimal way. All the hinge pins were about two mil in diameter um, that hold all together. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, Troy sneezes like a girl. Um, so when you look throughout the whole car, it's not the kind of car that would be as durable as where we are now. But also they didn't have to jump these massive no. jumps and things and stuff like that. And also they didn't jump and land so well. Um, from when I've done running, when we've had the re-release cars of these, um, it was surprising how, how little handling they had on these situations. An example would be on the front, I need to be really gentle on the front, um, but it's got a crash back system, which allowed the wishbones to su su survive crashes. And what it allowed was this, this O-ring will break if you pull it too hard, it allowed the wishbones to come back, which was, Fantastic idea. The problem is, is when you landed jumps or too hard on the steering, your wishbone moved. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, so you had to let the car stabilise and go from there. But back then, they didn't have as much power. They drove it gently and they just kind of rolled the car around a lot more. Well, so, I, I remember seeing a system like this when I first started racing, and I think it would have been ProCat, BossCat. So BossCat like ProCat, I think, still carried it. And uh, <clears throat> I remember I went to marshal it because it was stuck in a pipe mm. and its arm was bent backwards, so I just picked it up as if it was broken and then it popped back and what is going on, mm -hmm. I don't understand. And mm. The driver was shouting at me to put it down. But yeah. uh, One of know. the beauties with it as well, you had a telescopic drive shaft, so you had basically a key on the inside of one part of the drive shaft, so you could bend it back all the way and this drive shaft just got longer and longer, so a very novel thing. And Cecil came from designing gearboxes at Cosworth, automatic gearboxes, got into the world of RC, he did the ball diff for the 12 scale cars mm -hmm. where they ran um, plastic tube wheels with uh, silicon sealing put on for grip and he only had spools at the time so he made a ball diff for it. And as time went on, Robin would go racing, a very young Robin at the time, and so they'd go venturing out um, doing off-road races and touring car and Cecil obviously with the company started, uh, was starting, um, wanted to, to produce a car so the XLS eventually came around after the 
iteration before. Um, and yeah, if we take the body shell off, well, unless well, you want well. to talk about... Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's talk about the stickers yep. on the body first. So obviously it was from Asami's car. Mm. Um, the obvious one down here at, at Schumacher. Yes. He got, I assume, given the car to run for the I event. I think we supported him yep. at the time. Yeah, I would imagine so. Mm. This. But back then we didn't have social media because he was relatively unknown at that point. Yes. You know, hadn't won a Worlds, this was his first Worlds as well. So mm. now it seems trivial because he's won, I don't know, 700 or something. Mm. But, um, but yeah. I guess they stopped counting. Powered by HPI is an interesting one. Mm. So did HPI make electronics back then? Who knows? It's interesting. Obviously made their own cars mm. in the in the future. So and part of the HPI, it's got Uno written there. Uno HPI. Is it the same HPI? Whoa, HPI? whoa, yeah. whoa. I'm HPI Frank, and I'm just here to drop some history on you guys. HPI, or Hobby Products International, was one of Masami's early sponsors and helped him get to his first world championship race. The blue label Uno motor, released in 1986, was one of the first HPI products and was famously funded by a loan of just $100, which helped pay for the first small batch of racing motors. Masami's win put Schumacher and HPI on the international stage, and the rest is history. HPI released more versions of the Uno motor, including the Jet and GTS models, plus car option parts, and eventually the legendary Savage and Baja models. And they're still making awesome bashers to this day. Now back to the lab. Well, the front's, front's similar on the, on the picture there. And then you've got ODS. Um, yeah. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Only drive system. Okay, that, that's yeah. exactly, that's what it is, kids. That's what um, it was. Yeah. Um, number one's obvious. Yep. Um, yeah, HPI Japan again here. Uh, what's this one? It's got a K something on there. Kyoto Sakura Circuit, I guess maybe his local track. Okay, that's cool. So um, we should do that more with our tracks. Have yeah, stickers have stickers. Japan's really good like that. They do support their local tracks with stickers a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, his race number here, 48, I'm guessing. That's nice as a dot matrix printer as well. See all the little dots yeah, on there. Were, I remember these type of stickers. They were awful to get off. Mm. Um, and KO Proper, a long, yeah. long time sponsor of Asami. Mm. So yeah, now. Get that body off. Okay, I've just seen the ODS trading on here as well. Okay. So maybe they're a distributor or something. Yeah, uh, only drive system. Yeah, yeah. ODS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so take the body shell off. It's held on by Velcro, but the Velcro is very old, so it comes off very easily. Um, I found this car a few times. Some nice white Velcro tabs, not too much. Nowadays, we wouldn't even risk that, would we? We'd, no, we'd want full a full strip. That's it. I guess he didn't crash. But they even nothing. had cutouts here for the mm. Velcro tabs. Yes. Um, so yeah, maybe it wasn't even meant one at the back. It just have so yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you wanna wanna yeah, talk well, about what you can let's, let's see what we can find see surprising. Here. Um, it's a nice yellow. It, it almost makes me think it's an aluminium chassis. It's well, like the, a the yellow the tub tubs. chassis. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not. It's just an under tray. Mm. And the chassis itself is actually quite thin. Um, comes it's out. We can get a shorty pack in there. That's very true. Yeah. They might even do that now with the retro cars that are running. Yeah. Um, the, so it's got a fiberglass green chassis, the, the familiar looking fiberglass sheet yep. that's on it. Um, I don't think carbon fibres were probably being introduced to the hobby at that point. No, no, probably um, really expensive and just for Formula One, right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, the bit that stood out for me actually, when we saw this um, not long ago, um, and I was thinking this is a modern speed controller in it, um, but Robin says it's it's the original, and I don't know, it looks very... It does very look good quality. Very modern. Speedo. Very nice uh, finish. Yeah. I would have been impressed with that in the 80s. Yeah, so I'd be interested to, to find out a bit more about that. Um, obviously, these are the original brushed Speedos where you can see the FETs, the tops of the FETs sticking out the top, which is your transistors, which does the switching to give power to the, the brushed motors, which, of course, nowadays we are on brushless and we don't have to deal with that anymore. It's interesting how the motor's plugged in, not soldered mm. on. Have a little look, because it's got yeah. a few terminals, because you've got like the Dean's type connectors, which have two, but these are tiny little terminals sticking out of that. Yeah, and four of them. Yeah. But it looks like it's got one for positive and three for negative. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's two on each one, just there, yeah. I think. But I guess maybe he didn't have many options. He found a connector from a local yeah, electronic supplier. You can't plug it in backwards when it's like that. That's true, actually. That's yeah. a fair point. They should do that on modern cars, shouldn't they? Yeah. We get less uh, products returned to us because people <laughs> plug them in backwards. Yeah. So, so there's only one battery stay. I guess this one's fallen off. Or? I, I feel like that must have happened. Yeah. So I think that's just like clipped in. It's resting on there. So there's that little screw kind of yeah, screw sitting from on there. Looks like you. Uh, oh, there's a hole in there. Yeah, you get your screw. Relaxing. Rather than just putting it this way, which would have made more sense, right? 
maybe, but it's kind of, I'm sure if we started playing with it, we'd find out, ah, I see. That's yeah. why we're not yeah, doing maybe. it. Obviously, flipping it over, um, it's the, the quite cool thing when I first kind of saw this car, um, I was like, oh, the belt goes underneath the chassis, um, which is quite a cool concept. We wouldn't do that now, um, but because they ran, I think, quite high ride heights, even though it wasn't really that high once you had this on, you've got a chassis which is about seven mil higher than the bit that's touching the ground. So your, um, your Lexan under tray um, is protecting your belt, but you're losing a lot of ride height. So mm. it was this kind of, well, what do we do? And if you put it on the chassis, that means you can't put your battery on there. Um, so you've kind of got a chassis that's almost, that's not the chassis bottom, that's the chassis bottom. It's just, you've got like almost a mid deck yeah. effectively. It's pretty cool being underneath. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I've not really looked at one of these cars very closely. Mm. Yeah, your battery runs in the middle of the belt. Yeah. Which I wouldn't have even thought about unless you just did that then. Yeah. So the other bit was uh, like setting belt tensions. Um, you had a scenario here where you have, um, you've got the gearbox and then you've got the effectively the eccentric, you know, it's eccentric, but your tension, you, I think you back the screws off, you can push it forwards, but also your belt doesn't have, um, your pulley doesn't have flanges each side, so your belt could fall off, but it's done like a modern belt drive systems on machines where you can tension one side or the other, so it then runs in the middle. If you've got a belt sander in the garage, you'll find that you can adjust one side and the other to make the belt run true. Um, so that's what you find in there. So they didn't have belts falling off because they could tune it. Um, and again, I'm not an expert in these. There's a lot of retro racing is out here probably shouting at the camera um <laughs> no no it's this it's that and people, people calm down it's, yeah but we're the doctors so that's fine. right that's yeah. it and, and we are coming in from a point of view of not knowing as much about it and we don't well i don't yeah the other bit is on the back of the car um it was what you'll see on um, touring cars, they run a rear steer system, so when they go through bumps, they get steering and stuff like that. Um, this car had a very early form of that, but more with the intention to adjust the rear towing, um, which we've got on some of our old, uh, well, it followed on for SSTs and stuff like that. Um, so you could carry the same hub carrier front and rear, and then you can tune your rear tow. Uh, and as you pointed out... Um, yeah, it goes into uh, to tow out of the yeah. bottom of the stroke and then comes in. Yeah. So we, you do have, what do they call it in touring car? ARS? Uh, ARS, yeah, yeah. ARS. ARS. So. You have an ARS. Oh, behave. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the, uh, what I'd like to do is take a wheel off, because I'd like to show you the fitment of the wheel to the, um, yes. well, the, the drive dog, let's call it. Um, so on current cars, we have 12 mil hexes. Um, on our 10th scale cars, uh, on the front and rear, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive buggies, and on trucks. Um, then before that, as we've you know seen over the years, you have pin drive and bearings in the front axles. Um, it'll be two and a half mil. Well, I wasn't yeah, expecting so very that long screw, screw to yep. be that long. Um, whereas back then, everyone could have had their own thing. Um, Tamiya had um, a three-spoke drive dog that went onto their, their wheel, which had holes in. Whereas this has got a carcelation on the inside of it. Explain and carcelation. To I call us. it carcelation because if you look at a castle, we have quite a few of them around the world. Um, at the top of the castle edges, normally you had a, I'm not sure the, the name of it, but the turrety bit at the top, um, you had the, the edges, the steps, the carcelations. Um, the carcelations. And so this had the carcelation drive, which we actually use on many of our cars. And with the carcelation, it was a bit tricky to fit. But at the time, it was a solution that Cecil came up with, from what I understand, to allow it to fit and get drive to it. Because at the time, he probably, you, when, you, when you're designing things, you might lead yourself down a route, route where you're using this bearing. The, the, the drive shaft itself, the assembly, will be done in a way that's going from this side. So now we need to get it on. So that was his solution at the time, which obviously powered the wheels forwards and helped get a fantastic result for the car. Yeah, and I'm sure if we had the power of today, it would probably rip straight through that consolation. And that's, and that's probably been tested with the, the, the retro races getting yeah. into the hobby, and I think they get away with it. I think over the years when we did some of our, um, let's say, more modern uh, fun cars, they'd have um, aluminium ones right. that would drive it, but even then the wheel might struggle. Um, so it's, it's an interesting one. Building the cars, from what I understand even now, is not the most fun thing. Um, the front roll bar that's on it, um, you would get the bit of wire. I can't remember, I might be wrong in saying this, but I'm not sure if you have to bend it to the right size um, to get it right, but you had to solder on these ends, and apparently that was a real pain, and I can imagine it was, because you've got a steel bit there soldering onto a bit, and with the soldering iron, it's just very hard to achieve that. Um, so that was one of the things, and like um, 
on the back we don't have a rear roll bar for whatever reason at the time. I guess he didn't need it. Um, so it's it's an interesting platform as a lot of people have a soft spot for it. They either didn't have one and they always wanted one because when we did a re-release it was very popular. Yeah. Um, and so then seeing the iconic market and how people have been tweaking and upgrading these a bit as well, fine-tuning, getting rid of issues that, that used to be around. So it's... Um, I don't know, it's generated a lot of interest. So th let's look at this, this spur gear arrangement here. Because obviously it's got huge teeth to start with. Mm. We're not meshed at the moment. I guess they had the motor checks and he's just whacked it back in at some point. Yeah, so... But why does it flop around? Uh, I, I'm not actually sure. I'd have to try and get that part <laughs> to, to see. But inside it's got something called an integrator. Right. So you've got a top shaft and you're going to have to really picture this now. But you've got the top shaft and you've got two belts. Um, running down to the rear differential. So imagine so you've got two pulleys there, and then on the differential you've got a pulley that's in between those two pulleys, and that runs to the front. When you go through differential action on, on the rear, um, you're not getting drive to the front. So when the diff is sliding around, whereas when both are working, the front is now driven. So it won't drive the front unless the, the rear two are in harmony and running together. So that was the integrator system that Cecil did. They went away from that later on, just a a belt going down to the rear and I think then driving the front. Um, but it was a real novel way of doing it, so you've got effectively a diff in the top and a diff in the bottom. So it could be part of that, that could have a set of balls on the inside of it, um, sitting inside that spur gear, um, and that's what it's resting on. And the balls are driving the spur gear, or the drive, sp spur gear is driving those balls, and then you've got a thrust assembly probably inside there. But I haven't really been into the retro side of things, but again there'll be people shouting at the camera, either telling me that I'm completely wrong, which is great. Um, leave a comment if you do somehow on some forum or on this video. Um, but the, the really, really interesting thing is the fact that Cecil came up with that from, from nothing before that, which yeah. I love, because that's what Cecil was all about. Very innovative. Yeah, that's it. Something less innovative is this. this Nice so that would have been nice fiberglass tape, tape yeah. which has lost its stickiness. Yeah, that's, there's a Masami just throwing it's, that in there. Yeah, so it's covering a little capacitor there. Yeah, a little cap. Oh, I see. So that's going... That's Straight to the speed like, controller. Yeah, so you've got a really tiny switch there, actually. Or is it to the speed? It go, does it go off the back of the switch? So you've got the red wire there. I think it's coming out of orange. this guy. What is that guy? I don't know. Oh. <sighs> my man, my man, my man. What's this thing with all these numbers? World Champion Model Special Edition. So you've got the receiver, then you've got a unit. So you've got the orange orange and black wires going from their receiver going into that. Yeah. Then the red and It'd be funny bit going if up there. Found out it was a gyro, right? Oh, we were coming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if they figured that out back then. That would be very interesting to find out. Unless it's some kind of booster to the servo or. Because you've got lots of wires going to the servo there. Yeah. There's Yeah, look how many wires. You've got oh, six it's wires. A gyro. Okay, I'm wondering if it's some kind of boostery thing. Yeah, because yeah. you got you got six wires going into the survey. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. And you got some coming from there and some come from there. So I'm wondering if it's like an external power because may, maybe they didn't have BECs back then. Yeah, because this is a FET servo. Okay. Um, it tells us that at least. I see. Ko PS87 limited edition FET servo. Hmm. Does it say BC on the receiver as well? So I'm wondering if that's something that came later. High sensitive AM radio controlled system. That's we interesting. Don't know. So uh, that would be something to learn about, isn't it? Yeah, it's been taped together. Yeah, because it looks like it's almost a box that it's sitting inside there as a nice cluster, but maybe there's a little, maybe some little circuit on the board. Side, you know. Do you think it would even say on it? Because I'm thinking is there's some tools around here and maybe we. Maybe Take we the could pinion just, off just, and screw the motor just back that motor out there a little yeah. bit. I reckon we can. I reckon it might not even need to take the pinion off, Trace. And the nice thing is you don't even have to unsolder it. That's true. What tool we need? Two and a half? I'm guessing so, because what you also notice on this car, it seems to be flathead panned screws. Yeah. Um, and then the only hexagon drive thing, and it, it, maybe this is added later, but, but he's got that, you know, two and a half mil hex drives there. Going back through the years, like hex drive wasn't very common. I, you know, coming from war time, everything was, it had a you know a hex head itself, um, and then things have just evolved over the years. And yeah, 
if you had to take this car apart, you need a nice flat head, which I think we've got in one of these drawers. Out of the way, he's done pink on either side. So you so still can't get it wrong. Still definitely can't get it wrong. There we go, look, the Uno. So what is it, what we've got written on there? So we've got writing on there, so we've got 0022. So maybe that was the stamp for like when IFMA, was it? it was IFMA back then, right? Yes. Um, yep. So they would have, I guess, approved it. Yep. And then you've got 88 written on there, 88 or eight in a symbol. Eight in a symbol. It's not 48, is it? Yeah, but that, looking at the wines, you know, you'd argue that's... A motor. Should we take the end off? Get the motor apart? Because it might have some writing on there. No, the look, apart. taking brushes out here. I'm not apologising. Only if I lose parts, I apologise. But what we need is a Phillips driver to get this apart. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to magic one from nowhere. Good, I, I helped you. I got the brushes out. Okay, so we need to take off that pinion as well. We've got 1.5. Yep. Thank you, thank you, sir, thank you. That's if it's a 1.5, which is not. It's an imperial number, so we're going to leave that on. But we want to be able to see the motor, don't we? Oh, we might have to get another driver in a second. What I'm wondering is, first of all, we want to look at the condition of the the com, or the commutator, to see the whole word. Um, also, normally the writing is on the armature, isn't mm, it? it is. What it is. I mean, if you were Paul Worsley, you could just count right now and work it out. Well, we can look at how many strands are on it in regards to, because it would be a double or a single. I'll take those shims off so I don't lose them separately. So it's got, it's a double. So we've got the two on there. How do you know it's a double? Tell uh, us. So we got, so when, when the motors be wound, sometimes you can use a thicker wire and you then do a single, so you might do eight turns, or use wire that's half the size, let's say, or compromise somewhere, and then you can do double, or you could do triple, so then it's even thinner, and they look really intense when you're looking at them, and even they, quads. Yeah, they had a quint as well. Quint, well, quint. that must have been an absolute mm. pain to do, but, but the com looks right. I guess it would have been freshly skimmed, um, but there's still like a lot of groove on it. Mm. But I guess it's dirt comes in there and everything. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but you know, that's been beaten up a bit. But when you've got the gap down there, that still looks nice. So it's pretty fresh at the same time. Um, it's not been like run for ages. And the diameter from the early part of it is, you know, it's really similar to it. Um, but as for what wind it is, I'm going to go get myself an 050 driver. Um, and I'll be back in two seconds. Cut. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ta -da! Um, so we'll, hopefully this is the right one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we've popped that out. Hopefully no shims come out. Okay, so it says 0022 on it. It's told you nothing, has and it? And there's a 21 and a 5. 21, 5? I feel like it... Oh, was it 2 slash 5? Two wines, but it's not 5 turn. Interesting. Do you think it's a 22 turn? Maybe that, that sounds like it's a bit, yeah, because a bit what, too many wines. What was a silver can? Oh. Were they 25? Oh, we did that. There was some bits in there. It's OK, I've got these ones. We haven't lost it. You're good. It's all right, I'm going to get so some hate silver letters. can was 25, right? I think, oh, was it more like 32 or 35? Because you've got your 27 turn, which was standard back then, wasn't it? So 20, yes, 27. Did you know that? So, so 27 was standard. So this would have been so a step forward. Because in the time that this came out, would that really been on trend? Like with the batteries, what were the battery sizes back then? What twelve hundred, something like that. So like you, you haven't exactly got loads of capacity to play with. So you're not going to run like a twelve turn. No, no. Because you're going to do two minutes. So you can feel the, the magnet. Because obviously on these motors compared to brushless, you're looking inside. On brushless motors, the coils are on the outside, and on the brushed motors, the coils are on the inside, and the magnets are on the outside on these. So that was how that went together. So I'll just pop that back in there. Yeah, the other bit I haven't mentioned actually is we've got these um, balancing mm. holes that are on here, which is cool. And this one's been shaved like crazy, huh? Yeah. And obviously there's no marks on the inside of that can. It would have just been maybe yeah, shaved just down. tweaked it. Because they put some big holes in already yeah, compared to the opposite side. Yeah, so trimming it. I wonder how legal that was. <sighs> Controversy. Anyway, that goes back in there. And then I'll pick up the shim. I'm not sure which way around it went. So that's a fibrous shim on there. So I'm wondering if that went on first. You know, again, people are going to be shouting at the camera. Try and get that one off my... This is where we need some tweezers. <laughs> to the toolbox. 
But considering how easy they fell off, again, this is against the surface, it wasn't there. But luckily, this isn't going to get run again anytime soon, so if I've done it slightly wrong, right, so that's there. So we'll drop it back together now. That goes on there. And which way, which holes did it go in, Lee? So the Uno, was that, that was at the top, wasn't it, in the car? It wasn't the other way up? Mm -hmm. Or was it the other way up? No, Uno came out first. This is that way, and then that was like that, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So was it like that? And then, yes, that plugged in there, so it goes this way around. Luckily, you were watching, right? Yeah, so there's, little, little, there's a divot there. Maybe. Yeah, maybe they didn't bother doing it back then. Maybe it was, no. Well, then, then they wouldn't have a mark in no, the end bill, right? Yeah, they well, normally they've got a... You know, like a little timing streak on there. Maybe it wasn't so common back then. Well, I guess it must have been common. Yeah. Right. We have a motor together. Do you want to put it back in? If I put the pinion, oh, we we'll put the pinion on afterwards. So it's lined up nicely. Sure. I'm kind of exhausted after all that screwing. Every time with you is like the first time. Right. Let's see if we can screw this back in. So what else? What are we gonna What are we gonna get into next? One thing that uh, was tricky on these is when you took the drive shaft off of the diff or the axle side, you had the universal drive shaft joint. Um, and to explain this, you had a square block and you had effectively tongs holding on one part of the block and then another pair of tongs holding the other part. And that would have full articulation and allow power to be transferred down the line. The negatives of it was the assembly mode. So it was plastic. So you need to have a, what was a UJ tool that we had, and it would go in there and basically bend out the tong, and you'd put your cruciform, this is inside it, your block with your pins on, and that would pop in, which wasn't always that easy. So you could use hot water to help soften the plastic, but you can't do that side of the track on the car. And so it ended up people kind of like losing bits of skin trying to do this. And once one's on, it's not stable because it rocks quite a bit. So you've got to try and get that on with the UJ tool. But the people that do this all the time, obviously became probably masters at this. This is, uh, this is also awkward. Yeah, and I'm wondering if it's on the right rotation, because when we plug it in, that wire is quite far on. another plate in here, right? Have we only got one set of holes, we've got two sets of holes. I don't know, should be fine. Yes, yeah, so it looks more like it needs to be like that. Yeah, because you can see the blue now as well. I'm in, I'm in. So we're in, gentlemen. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And, and ladies, watching. So obviously that was the drive shafts for them. Um, I know over the years they developed things on the more modern cars using the telescopic systems and having one-way drive units in there that allow the wheel to roll when you're on brakes. Um, and obviously the wheels do the rear braking, but when on power they get drive. But I believe on this car it would have been standard and that's something you can check. I'm gonna let Lee do this. You can check by obviously spin the front wheels. But this had the ball diff unit in there. Um, and again, we didn't have gear diffs back then. I see Lee's trying to get these screws in. Yeah, I'm trying to be nice to it, but um, I'm just going to turn it on its side and deal That's with it. That's fine. And of course, things haven't changed putting motors on your cars from back then. So this is a, a car from 87, and we're still doing put motors on with the same screw pitch. So I think there's two screw pitches. There's 25 mil and 24.5 or 25.4, whichever one it is. Um, and, you know, it still stands. So we've not moved on in some areas to much different concepts. So the servo, you could fit that in a modern car and probably race with yeah. it. You probably wouldn't want to because the poor thing deserves a rest, even the, or, you know, or the whole electric system. Um, interesting doing that with a modern car, run old stuff inside it instead of running old cars with new bits. Yeah. Um, on the steering, it was all very delicate as well. So you have these tiny ball cups on here. Um, that ran down there. You've got your opinion on everything. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to, uh, it wasn't actually meshed before, so I'm going to leave it unmeshed. Okay. Because cool. it's how it was. Yeah, maybe that's how it finished the race. But well, they would have taken it out. Would have yeah, taken sorry. it out to check. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so on the on the steering, it was kind of quite a small, small kind of assembly that went around here. So it's, I don't know, I just, I just love the fact that that survived back then. I mean, it's the crazy to now. think that that steering assembly survives, right? I mean, look how thin it is mm. and tiny. Be interesting what the like the vintage races, not that they're vintage, but when they race like, the iconic series and stuff like that, what they do. So yeah, and again, the crash pack probably comes into play when it's needed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the shocks! So the shocks are, are an interesting one, um, and we need to get it open so you can see what's in it. But they're very different to what we have today. I don't know if you oh, want really? to have a getting it apart or. 
Well, which one do you want to do, front or we, rear? We do the do the rear one because I think it's more accessible. I think they're both as accessible as each other. Maybe the front's easier to get to because we can get that easier. Yeah, the front's easier. nice and easy. Yeah, two 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 and a half mil two driver. Two and a half mil driver, nice and easy. We got all the tools. Now we have every tool, <laughs> including ourselves. Until we don't have them. So, so what, what are we expecting to see in here? I mean, this okay. definitely wouldn't have been open since 1987. So shock absorbers back then, there was various things being tried to, to get the things working. All I know is what's in our re-release cars. So I don't know what's in here. Speed secrets. That. There might be some speed secrets in these. Um, but they used to play with, from what I understand, different size pistons to allow different blow-by, um, as well as having notches in them in a bigger notch or a smaller notch. Um, but I'm not sure what's in here. Might just have some normal hold pistons that we're used to. Um, so. so we have a, a small spacer at the bottom here, yep. which has been cut. Um, the cuts are to the top, so I guess it allows a little bit more clearance. Okay. Our screw in the top, we have a couple more spacers. That's to the inside, that's to the inside, and then there's one that goes through. It's a little bush. So I'm leaving this bit to you now. Yeah, so then we've got our spring cup that's down here, which slides back over the rod end that drops out here. So that's very different to what we mm. have today. Kind of probably with a view to make it not fall off. Yes. Which is another thing. Tiny little spring, look at yeah. this. And the assembly of the shocks um, has a, basically there's a recess in here. You can drop your bits in there or your, your parts to go inside. Um, and then you've got a a C clip, which you need a special tool to get that out, yeah. which is very fun. And, and it, as soon as you get it about three millimeters past that point, it'll ping that way, yep. and you have to get a new one. Yeah, okay. I, I remember doing some of these on different cars, and it was. Mm. <sighs> so taking the shock cap off, obviously quite a modern way of having shock caps on that point. Um, I don't know if Careful. these are Schumacher ones. So we've got our O-ring in here to seal it off. So again, a technique that hasn't gone away. No, um, miss. Oh. Just an O-ring, yeah, don't let that come out. So if I just push it really carefully, we just let it then drift away, get back inside. And what you'll see is we've got our yellow piston here, which isn't super thick, so it's probably, what, a mill and a half thick across that bit, can you see? The one, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, pretty thin. something like that. Um, and then we've got a notch yeah, cut we have, out. And we that's, have no holes. Yeah, so the rear and the front would have different size notches to then define where you have the normal blow-by that you have on the piston, where the oil comes around, that would be an easier path, and you can tune damping for it. So that's that. So I won't put it in too hard, because it will so go over our faces. So why do you think we do a notch now? I guess someone tried holes and preferred it. We should try it. Let's go test Maybe it. they couldn't do massive holes then, because the, the E-clip there is so big, it wouldn't allow yeah. the hole to... It'd be interesting in the measuring the bore, because I don't know if that's 10 mil, or if it, maybe it was 9 or something yeah. like that. Because Back Go then, careful on the way down. That's when it can That's split. it. Um, back then, you had your your competitors running. You know what did they have in their shocks? What I, were they I, running? I would say that that's less dirty than than dirty, other shocks it? that yeah. I've seen. Yeah. I would argue Cecil did a great job designing that shock seal housing, providing this is a Schumacher shock with this one. I know sometimes people use other brands of things, but that's one. But I'm not so sure about on that bit. I don't know if that's a Schumacher. No, it is. Yeah, we've got the, the top cat over there. Not top, that's just a cougar over there that's got the same ones on. So that's one of ours. I know there's various other things right. out there. And you see things on, so uh, be open and honest. Obviously, I'm not a complete expert on our more vintage cars. So that goes back on there. Does it slot over anymore? No, I think that's it. That's it? Yeah, so that's it. Obviously, to show you a modern version with using similar parts, just grab the cougar here. Um, obviously, it's got the plating on there. So they've got the plating there, but it's more of a gold sheen. But you know, we're still replicating the same things there. So it's yeah, interesting looking at that. Yeah. So who do you think would have last built this shop, Phil? No, I think Masami would have done some. some oh, I don't think Masami. It. Masaki you think, probably would have. Oh, I see his father. Yeah. I reckon they would have been tuning it on the day because I think Phil built up a few cars for people, and obviously off they went. I'm yep. assuming Phil would have been there as well. Um, be interesting and, to know what oil. Do you think they tested shock angles? I think I think there was a they they like stuck with that one just on yeah, the top just there. Yeah, you reckon they? Yeah. Though at the bottom, I'm sure they probably tried out some of them because I think there's four holes. At the bottom here, we have three holes, but we have one that has a roll bar in it. 
as yeah. well. So we have four total. Yeah. Yeah, so on the back we've got four there, which I guess one is also for a roll bar, it in there. It's a very long screw for the bottom one. It's like it went through most of the arm. Mm. I wonder if that gave it a bit more strength. Do you think it was fear of it coming out Maybe. and stripping? Or it was, because that's quite a cool way of stiffening the arm back off as well. I mean, well, it looks it? like the tunnel's quite long for it. Mm. Um. Well, it's because it's left and right wishbone, so I guess it's a non-handed arm, so you just had the pin all the it way through. just went all the way through. Yeah. Obviously, back then, getting tools made and things would have been quite expensive, even if you're doing it yourself. So, the more commonality you can have, kind of the better for them. Yeah, definitely. Right. So, rear end. What? What? what yeah. So, what on the rear, um, we have a very adjustable back end. So, you've got um, these blocks, and very similar to what kind of quite a few modern cars have had. But you can then just change, obviously, shims to say a bit more, yep. toe, a bit less toe, a bit more anti-squat. Uh, but anti-squat doesn't look like it's as adjustable. You've got fixed blocks there, screwing into the aluminium side plates. Which yeah, are only two mil wide. You thick. have a couple of holes in that block. Mm. So it looks like you, you could have a few variations. Block mm. I up, guess block you can down. flip things around, yeah. 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 Okay. So it's obviously that's being thought about even mm. back then, when it was more about screwing the cars together than it was about yeah. setting them up. Yeah, finish five minutes, please. And then we have to talk about the, the elephant in the room, which is the, the wing. There I is mean, the wing. There, I thought you were going to talk about the other elephant in the room, was uh, the, the antenna. Oh, the antenna. Did that the have non -antenna. a tube? Oh, like, it would have definitely had a tube. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering where's the tube gone over those years. So that couldn't have been like that in there. So no, it would have been screwed. So yeah, the wing, the wing. Yeah. So it was the classic style. So it's on a piece of wire, which we saw on like the B3 had that. Yep. Yeah. Was, At I least guess, this one is, is fixed in, whereas mm -hmm. a B3 one, after a good crash, you could end up without a wing. So, yep. That's right, yeah, because you've got the little screw clamps in there. Yeah, so that's at quite an angle, quite high. Yeah. But that was almost tradition with F1 back then, maybe. Yeah, yeah, so back big in the wing. 80s, yeah. So they kind of go in with things that they know and understand from, well, the modern, well, not at the time, the modern race the cars. Modern race cars. Yeah. yeah. The so, 80s, uh, the crazy time. Mm, if you did that now, I think people might call me a bod um, and say, why are you doing that for? Well, that's what they did back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe so, we should try it. Yeah, let's try it next test. So, yeah, this is Masami's 1987. World's winning car, and really the the start of of Schumacher. You know, yeah, it really pushed them into put them on the map. Put them on the map. Put yeah. us on the map. So yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, one thing I will say in the comments below, I feel that there will be a lot of people um, who were from the era of racing these and currently race these now, racing the Vetro classes. Obviously, be kind, um, but leave comments letting us know a bit more about this and the stuff that we don't quite know and got right. Cause it'd be nice to to see what you have to say. Thanks for watching. Bye. That's it for this video, but don't forget to subscribe and check out the rest of our RC Racing video series. And don't forget, be an RC TV hero. Make sure to hit that join button and find out all the details about being an RC TV hero.